This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon. Viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manassero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manassero, and this is a show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes, type in Old Dogs, spelled D A W G, find our podcast, and subscribe. Well, we've got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about asset protection. This is a really important one. If you are a real estate investor or an aspiring real estate investor, this is an area you really need to know what you're doing. Our guest today is uh, Brian T. Bradley, and he is an asset protection attorney for self-made entrepreneurs, business owners, doctors, real estate investors, and HNW families. He focuses on giving client peace of mind. Brian is, was selected to the Lawyers of Distinction list in 2019. Also the Super Lawyers Rising list 2015 and nominated to America's top 100 high stakes litigators list. He was also nominated to the 2017 Law Firm 500 Award. Brian also works as a chief knowledge officer, uh, helping other businesses maximize their value, manage intellectual capital and knowledge, identify and integrate new products, and integrate technology, and writes on higher level asset protection for the Oregon State Bar Law Journal. Well, Brian, welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. Hey, thanks, Bill, for having me on and putting this podcast together. And, you know, I really think this is a big and misunderstood topic, but it's going to be necessary, like you said, for anyone investing or owning any businesses or trying to make themselves cash flow through real estate um, and, you know, something to keep for, for their retirement. So thanks for having me on. Oh, well, it's our pleasure. I think this is going to be a, a great topic for, for our listening audience. Uh, you know, but before we get started, uh, you know, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, who, who is Brian here and uh, uh, where do you come from and how did you get into to law and, uh, you know, ultimately into real estate uh, as well? Yeah. So, um, you know, as you said, I'm an asset protection attorney and what we're doing is, you know, giving clients at the end of the day, just peace of mind to protect what you have and what you're going to have. And, you know, you can go and find your financial advisor to help you stop doing stupid things with your money. But then when you stop doing stupid things, you need to protect what you have. And I got into law because, you know, I was a you know baseball player, a good athlete. And in college, my arm just got completely destroyed and I had to figure out something to do with my life. Went to law school, didn't want to have a lot of debt. So I went to a small law school, uh, interned during the day at the district attorney's office in Santa Barbara, uh, went to school at night. And then I came out of law school just at the wrong time, you know, great, great, second great depression, great recession, whatever you want to call it these days. And I had to figure out what to do with my life because my job offer to be a prosecutor got rescinded because the whole state of California got put on a hiring freeze for about four years. And so I got into uh, civil litigation and just built myself up as a trial lawyer um, and just jumping into as many cases as I possibly could. And the problem at that time was that 
the recession was so bad, it trickled into the private practice area. So I was literally just knocking on state organizations' doors saying, hey, I'll represent your clients literally for free since no one has any money. You just have to front the cost. I need to get into court. And so I literally worked for three years just going into trial, um, representing the clients, getting no payment whatsoever. Um, but I ended up having more trial experience, I think, just in those three years than most 25 practicing, you know, 25 year practicing lawyers did just because I just said, I need to get this done. I need to jump into the deep end. And then as I was building my practice, I just, uh, realized so many clients were coming in after the fact, once they were being sued and they were investing and they had a false sense of security. Um, they thought that their revocable living will would protect them and their assets if they were being sued, which it can't do. It's not designed to do that, so that offers no protection. Um, or they thought they can just rely on their insurance, um, which is never the case. And um, they simply just had this false sense of security that their insurance and the revocable living trust would protect them. And then they're getting sued, their lives are turned upside down and there was nothing really much that I can do at that point to protect what they had. And so I just decided I saw enough of this hardship and I wanted to get ahead of the problem. And so I incorporated asset protection into my law firm to help the clients be proactive and get ahead of potential issues and problems when there are none at the point, you know, already and give them true positions of protection and strength if there ever is a rainy day. And so what we do is higher levels of asset protection for clients that have essentially outgrown that basic LLC setup. Um, and so what my firm specifically does is work with these higher network clients who hit or turn that you know 1 million net worth mark because it's taken most people a really long time to build the 1 million or 2.5 million. But the problem with that net worth is that one lawsuit can completely wipe you out. And it's one of those you know, lower rib floating punches that you're probably not going to recover from, from that, you know, 1 million, 2.5 million net worth. And so what we're going to be talking about today does come with, you know, a higher initial one-time startup cost, generally around $25,000, $30,000 for a high level asset protection trust. But on the flip side of it, you know, that client profile and their needs, exposure, risk, and visibility are just a lot more. Gotcha. Well, um, you know, this is a, a hot area for us. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm in California myself. It's a high litigation oh, <laughs> state, yeah. you know, um, but there, you know, there are folks, uh, a lot of people in California that are investing in other states. We have, you know, properties maybe in multiple states. And, and that is one of the, you know, the, the concerns with the one, you know, you can't always be at your properties and you don't know, you know, what's, what's going on there at any given time, um, yeah, outside of just, just the communication with the property manager or whoever's, you know, taking care of that, that property for you. But, um, yeah, you know, we're, we, we recognize the vulnerability we have and, and generally we'll, 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 you know, we'll set up our, our properties and, LLCs. Some people do land trusts. That you know, different different ways of, of handling it. How would you direct people that are doing that, that are investing in rental properties? Um, you know, we recognize in you know, you know, I've I've had my experience with people that have uh, you know tried to uh, you know get money out of you know an accident that happens. They may you know again go to the insurance company. They may go to uh, you know higher means. What what, uh, what are the options out there, and and what do you see as some of the more secure ways of protecting your assets? Yeah, so that's a great question, and so I think we just answer that by looking at a roadmap of asset protection. And so there's lots of ways that exist to skin a cat. You know, some are just better than others. And so let's go down this roadmap of asset protection. And so when we're driving down the road, you really have three stops. But the goal of each is the same. It's to get the assets out of your personal name. And then each stop just has a different level of strength. And so the first stop is what we, you know, you mentioned a few times is the LLC, the limited liability company. The next stop after that is an asset management holding company that's going to incorporate those LLCs into it. And then there's a more streamlined tax filing option. And then the final stop is an asset protection trust. And these can either be domestically set up or set up offshores in like the Cook Islands. And so I just want to break down each stop in more detail. Uh, our first stop 
is the LLC. Uh, it's a good entry point to establish some basic level of protection. You know, I use them and I use them for clients. Um, but then as the clients grow, the level of protection they need also grows. Um, you can't, you, you don't want to just keep stuffing as many assets and properties into one else LLC as possible because if one property blows up, the damages can then bleed into everything else. And so then you start adding more and more and more LLCs, and that's just gonna start getting more and more expensive, and the maintenance is gonna be a nightmare. And so everybody's heard of LLCs, so I really don't wanna spend much time on them, but um, with you need to understand that there's pros and cons, and most people only talk about the pros and sunshine and rainbows, and then when they do get sued in court, they get surprised about all of a sudden that this LLC might be pierced and you held personally liable for it because no one ever explained this to them. Um, so if you're trying to protect just a few assets and your money is limited, uh, you're just starting out, LLCs are affordable. They're a great entry point. You're going to get some limited personal liability out of it. But the weaknesses is that the protection or its bail can be pierced. And if that happens, you're going to be held personally liable for the lawsuit and the damages. And then depending on the states um, and that jurisdiction that you're in, you can either have really strong charging orders or horrible ones. Like in California, horrible. I'm in Oregon, horrible. Um, New York, horrible. And what a charging order is referring to is how much a creditor can collect from you. Um, and good state charging orders make the charging order the sole remedy. They can't bleed into other assets. But states have started differentiating themselves to just how serious they are about asset protection. Um, like California, again, horrible asset protection state and a very litigious, like the number one hellhole litigious state five years running in a row. So if protection is important to you, then you need to understand these points. And just remember that LLC is a good starting point and it's used more just as a deterrent for smokescreen to try to drive up litigation costs. Um, what's missing is the full strength that you really will need when you get to that higher 1 million net worth level. Um, you need the offshore component or the asset protection trust component and the power of what's called statutory non-recognition to just say, we don't care what judgment you have, go pound sand, we don't recognize it which then would bring us into the next stop on the road, the Asset Protection Trust. Uh, you know, just to take a step back a little bit too, yeah. so, sort of like first lines of defense. I have had situations in my own experience and maybe others listening too, where you have, let's say, tenants in an apartment building, something you know, sort of questionable that uh, they claim happens or something like that. Let's say it isn't something that's real obviously your fault or what have you. It, it's real interesting because sometimes these attorneys will call um, representing that that tenant um, and they don't even ask for <laughs> the property manager, the owner. I mean, they really just ask for, you know, who, who's the insurance company that represents yeah. this. So the so first lines of defense, you recommend people have sort of an umbrella policy to, to sort of fend off those little frivolous lawsuits? I would say first line of the, well, no, because insurance in that isn't going to actually, from the litigation side of it, deter frivolous lawsuits because as a plaintiff's lawyer, most lawyers look towards, okay, does this person have insurance? Yes, great. I'm going to go after the, the insurance policy, the money there. So it actually, you know, the insurance is good as a first line of defense um, and you need to have insurance, but you also need to understand that the business side of trials and litigation is I'm looking at where am I going to get my money from? And I'm going to be looking at insurance policies and what other assets you own that I can claim off of. Right. I mean, after the if if the insurance amount isn't enough, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. they're just going for five thousand or a couple of thousand, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, and they figured that's a quick, easy move without having to go through, you know. Yeah, and insurance is great to have, you know, and it's good for those small claims, but it's really bad for big claims. Let me just jump into the insurance topic real quick because it's a big misconception that hey, I got insurance, I can just purely rely on this. Um, this isn't the case. You need to read your insurance policy, read the fine print, and understand what's not covered and what the claim limits actually are. And I think maybe one out of 10 people actually do that. Um, so a good place to start is if you're investing in real estate, just understand it's the most heavy, heavily litigated area of law there is. And so it's not really a matter of when, but in what condition you're gonna be in to defend yourself when you are sued. It's just a matter of time if you're investing in real estate or you own a business. And so just keep in mind also that insurance companies don't cover you for fraud, punitive damages, or intentional wrongdoings. Um, they don't pay claims that are quote unquote, the direct result of your unlawful acts. 
whenever you are sued, that's what insurance defenses are always going to be. You know, like they get paid by collecting premiums and not paying out. And so their insurance defense, when it comes down to a court, is always going to say, you made a statement. Those statements are deemed by the court as intentional acts. We don't cover you for potential intentional wrongdoings. If you think we're wrong, go ahead and sue us and try to get your money out of us. And so now you're stuck with being sued while also having to sue your insurance provider to try to get the money that you think that you're owed from them. And it turns into this double-edged whammy. Gotcha. Gotcha. Definitely. Yeah, no. So we just broke down the LLC and the pros and cons. And then what happens when you outgrow the LLC and you need some more protection? And so the next stop is going to be an asset protection trust. And then you can actually set those up in two separate different jurisdictions, either domestically or offshore. And so what jurisdiction means is that the laws and the rules that govern you and trust and business entities are different from one jurisdiction to another, which is, you know, one state to another, one country to another. And um, I personally prefer the power of going offshore if and when it's ever needed, but it's not for everybody. Um, but the reason I prefer it is just because it's the best home court advantage, especially when you start getting into the higher net worth um, clients. It makes lawsuits go away very fast. You know, they're quickly resolved for pennies on the dollar, even against what we call super creditors, which is the government, you know, the IRS and SEC coming after you. Um, and the power of these offshore trusts like the Cook Islands is that they have what's called, I mentioned before, statutory non-recognition. Um, and so this just means that a creditor is going to come up to them and say, hey, I have a judgment, but that judgment is going to be completely worthless because they don't recognize any other country's um, court orders or judgments. They're just going to go tell them to go pound sand. The person suing you would have to actually go and start the case all over from scratch, facing the murder standard, which is beyond a reasonable doubt, in the Cook Islands. They'd have to front all the court costs, fly in a judge from New Zealand. If they lose the lawsuit, they'd have to pay. And with the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, um, they're most likely going to lose. And then the statute of limitations is only one year. And so by the time they even realized that's where they had to sue you, they probably already missed that chance. But like everything, like LLCs, even there's pros and cons to everything. And so if you're purely foreign, meaning offshore in like the Cook Islands, um, it's going to be effective. I mean, five out of five stars. You don't get much better than statutory non-recognition. But the three other factors that you look for is, you know, control, cost, and compliance. And that's where going purely offshore falls a little short. And for a foreign asset protection trust to work, you have to be out of control and subject to the foreign trustee. A lot of people are uncomfortable with that. The annual maintenance cost is going to be a lot higher. It's going to be around $5,000. Do I even send $10,000 a year? And then if you're purely foreign, you have a lot more IRS reporting and asset disclosures that you have to file, like your 3520s and 3528s. And so we only put about 5% of our clients that ever have to go purely foreign. For most people, it's just way overkill. Then you have the purely domestic component of it. So then what's the difference between offshore and domestic? Because we have asset protection trust here in the U.S. Um, they're going to be less expensive with cost and maintenance fees, They're going to, but they're going to fail on effectiveness and control. And they fail on those two points because of just the principles of asset protection. You know, the foundation is to not recognize another jurisdiction's court orders. You want to be able to tell a creditor, just we don't care, go pound sand. Um, but the hallmark of the U.S. legal system is the U.S. Constitution. You know, so we have the full faith and credit clause. You can't run from judgments, and we have to give full faith and credit to all court orders and proceedings, no matter what state it comes from. And we're also starting to see in litigation and trial work a pattern of all these just U.S. purely based domestic asset protection trusts being pierced. So we have this case like Inray Hubbard, Dale versus Dale, Tony One versus Wacker. Um, these were all good cases, but the courts just completely disregarded, for example, a California resident using an out-of-state Nevada asset protection trust. And so you're looking at the landscape. You know, I have LLCs. I outgrew it. I need to do something now to protect more net worth. I can either create these domestic asset protection trusts or foreign. What do I do? Which do I pick? And if you don't need to go purely foreign, then I would say you don't need to pick either option. You know, there's something that exists called the bridge trust, and it's a hybrid of both the domestic and foreign asset protection trust, and you're just combining the best of both worlds. And so this trust was created 30 years ago, and the word bridge is just used to demonstrate how you're using both a foreign trust and connecting two countries together, and you just cross the bridge if and when it's ever triggered and needed. 
for any of your like CPAs or lawyer listeners out there, you know, who are also investing or just if you like to really geek out on this stuff, um, the Bridge Trust is an irrevocable tax neutral grantor trust. And why you want these trusts to be irrevocable is that if you are ever challenged in front of a judge and the judge says, hey, I see you own some assets. I think you're in control of those assets. I want you to bring them back so we can collect on them. You need to have the power to say, no, I can't. It's irrevocable. I can't do that. Um, and what a grantor trust means is that you're the creator of the trust. You retain some of the powers over your assets. And then like all asset protection trusts, they're self-settled spendthrift trusts. So they're created by you, for you, as your own beneficiary. And so these bridge trusts are both foreign and domestic together. This is because, and they're going to be considered domestic because they're written to comply with USC Section 7701 on the court test and control test. And why we care about this is um, it means, what it means is it's, not a foreign IR, a foreign trust in the realms of how the IRS is going to look at you. So you don't have any of those IRS filings and asset disclosures of any kind. So it's going to be streamlined. It's easier. They're cheaper to set up. And the annual maintenance, annual costs are going to be cheaper, generally $2,100, not the five or $10,000 that you normally would be expecting to pay. So you have the ease and functionality of a domestic asset protection trust with the power and strength of the Cook Islands, go pound sand, we don't care, in your back pocket if you ever needed it. And so the way these road stops all work and how it all comes and gets put together is the first stop on the roadmap, you have your LLC, and that holds your real estate and all your other assets that can hurt somebody or has a key or it can go boom. The next stop you have is your asset management limited partnership, which acts as the holding company. And it holds those LLCs and it holds the cash and stocks and bonds, your receivables, you know, whatever. Essentially, anything that can hurt somebody, it holds. The LLC will be held inside that AMLP. And then we use these AMLPs because they have a delineation or what's called a separation between a managing partner, which is the general partner, and a minority partner, which isn't. Um, you, the client, will be the general partner of the AMLP. And this gives you control of the assets and the holding company. You can use them. You can do a benefit from them however you want. And then the final stop, like we talked about, is the asset protection trust, the bridge trust. And it's going to be the minority limited partnership owner. So it's going to own the AMLP. That's the, the ownership share of it. And so what happens is either you die, there is no attack, your shares get passed on, how your revocable living trust tells you. Or there's a triggering event, you're sued, the assets cross the bridge, you have the full strength and protection that you need. You go tell the creditor to go pound sand, you settle the case for pennies on the dollar, case goes away, assets come back to the domestic side. Got it. The domestic side, would that include the DST, the Delaware uh, Statutory uh, Trust as well? No, you wouldn't put, so for California, it's an interest. So the Delaware Statutory Trust is good as an asset holding company for California residents, only if you want to create a similarity of like a series LLC and categorize out assets in a specific like children's sub series. And the only reason we use DSTs for California residents is to try to decrease the um, franchise tax, you know, the $800 per LLC that people pay. Um, but Delaware statutory trusts are still domestic and it's like any, it, it offers the same amount of strength as an LLC, um, or anything else domestic. And so, but you're not going to put a trust inside a trust. Okay. Uh, now I've heard of where people will use, let's say land trusts with a DST. Yep. And so, well, you wouldn't use a land trust with the D you would use a land trust with an LLC because if you were to own a piece of property, you know, an investment property, you have a mortgage on it. You wouldn't want to transfer that property into an LLC with a mortgage on it because the bank will say, hey, you're transferring that. There's a mortgage and they'll probably call the mortgage due. But what you can do is transfer that into a land trust. Um, and then the bank will say, OK, you're just transferring it into a trust. We understand that. We like that. That's fine. It won't cause the mortgage, you know, the due on sale clause to come around. But land trusts have no protection on their own. They're just trust to hold land. So you connect them with an LLC just to get a little bit of um, that limited liability protection. Um, the way you would work with, you were saying like the DST, is you would have a, a Delaware statutory trust. You would move your assets 
into the Delaware Statutory Trust to just hold them. You can't operate out of them, otherwise they lose their um, business um, exe- you know, uh, designation. So they're just holding long-term assets in there. You can't operate out of it. You would have to create a side LLC to act as your operating company with the Delaware Statutory Trust. I got it. So let's say you have an LLC for Ohio. Yeah. You've got uh, each individual property you want, uh, you know, uh, instead of you know having them all under that LLC, to, would it make sense to create land trusts for those and then uh, and then have it under the LLC? It would depend if you had mortgages on the property or not. If you didn't have any mortgages on the property and you just hold them outright, then you wouldn't need the land trust. If you had mortgages on the property, then you would use the land trust, or you can create depending on what the net worth is of the client, the asset management limited partnership, put all those LLCs into the general partnership share. And then you would put in the bridge trust as the control, you know, the owner of the AMLP. And then because you're using the bridge trust, it's a trust and you can move like your personal residence into the trust portion of it. Got it. And and, and what, what about the, the significance of the LLCs that are from Wyoming or, or uh, Nevada, you know, because yeah. they don't require your, your name on them. I, I mean, is there, is there any value to those? Yeah, really what you're doing is like I talked about, like charge, charging order shopping. Um, and so I, I, as a, as a trial lawyer, I think it's, it's nice because it just causes the other party to spend a little bit more money to try to get through the information because you have this like, Oh, anonymity, um, anonymity works, but in a sense to where I'm just forcing the other party to pay more money to find out my name, you know? And then what you're doing is with Delaware and Wyoming, Texas, Arizona is just shopping around for better charging orders. But the weakness of it is it doesn't smash the um, pass the smell test. So let's say you're a California resident and I own assets in California and I created a Delaware, you know, LLC and I'm being sued in California. You think you're going to convince a California judge to go and use the charging order laws of another state that the assets not even in the judge is just going to say, no, we don't care. You're being sued in California. This is California tort law. I'm going to apply the laws of the state where the property you and the lawsuit happen. Thanks. I don't care. Got it. Got it. And you always create the LLC in the state where you own the property because Mm -hmm. that's where you're going to be sued. And so that's where if you are going the LLC route, um, you don't go to out of states, you know, other states where the asset's not at, because if that property blows up, you're going to get sued in that state. So that's where the lawsuit is. Those are the state that state's going to, you know, those laws are going to be applied there. So you want to be able to pass the smell test and not look bad in front of the judge. Can you have that LLC underneath another LLC in, in one of those other states like a Wyoming? I mean, yeah, it gets really convoluted like that. But the way, as you start growing, you would just have an LLC own an asset or two. You know, we kind of stop it at a million because you don't want to have too much equity in one LLC. And then you would create another LLC. And then you start getting into then you need a management company. And that would be like the asset management limited partnership. And then you would move those LLCs into that. And that would just be managing those LLCs and it would make it more streamlined to file your taxes. But you would still get the separate protection of each LLC because that's what the assets held in. Right, right. And what about for you know, guys that are just starting out, maybe they, they don't have that much in way of assets. Their, their, you know, net worth isn't, isn't there yeah. yet. Um, uh, you know, what's a, sort of a more economical approach for those folks? Yeah. So that's where you start out on the first stop on the road, you know, LLC, you don't want to hold anything in your own personal name, you know, do what the rich do, you know, the rich people, they own things, but they don't own them. Their LLCs their business entities, their trust on them. They just get the beneficial use and enjoyment. So start off in what you can afford. Just get everything out of your own personal name. Start with an LLC and the land trust. And then as you start growing, just realize where you start most likely just like in anything in life, isn't where you're going to end up. And so as you start becoming more successful and accumulating more and your net worth starts really increasing, you need to realize I am more visible. I have more at risk. This really is just smoke screen. Now I really can get sued for a lot of money. What's the next level of protection I need? And you just incrementally stage it and move it up as li- as your life goes on. Sure. Well, what, what are some of the, the, the biggest uh, mistakes you think people make, uh, you know, just coming out of the shoot that 
you know, there are things that, uh, <laughs> you know, if, if they had had the foresight, uh, w wouldn't have gotten uh, into a, a mess. Yes, there. Great question. I think they're, you know, they're DIYing the systems themselves are doing absolutely nothing and just relying on lady luck, you know, or, you know, thinking their insurance will cover them. You know, that's the biggest mistakes I've seen. You know, a lot of investors are self-made, so they're used a lot, you know, they're used to doing everything themselves. So they think that they can create these legal entities and legal documents and structures, you know, all with legal implications themselves without knowing how to properly do it. They, you know, do some Google searches, just like, you know, my wife's like, oh, you're a hypochondriac, you're a Google doctor. <laughs> Stop being a Google doctor. Same thing. Stop being, you know, a Google lawyer, you know, hire the experts. You know, you got to know how are these going to hold up in court and in trial, you know, in case you ever are challenged. So you shouldn't be penny pinching on things that have legal implications. Get them done right. You're going to save more money in the long run. Um, what I'll tell your listeners is like anything that you do as a DIY with the law or templates that you find and use are not going to be done most likely properly and per your you know intent. And if it ever is challenged in court, it's just going to get utterly destroyed. You know, it's not going to be worth the paper that it was ever printed on. So you just created a false sense of security because you are you know penny wise dollar stupid. Um, what your listeners should learn is just rely on experts and professionals. You know, use your team, set up a team. If you do, you're going to save more money in the long run. You're going to, you know, you know, you do what you're good at. Let us do what we're good at. Let everybody else, the experts, your financial advisors, do what they're good at, and you're going to make more and be more efficient in the long run. And for folks that have done it right, uh, do you have a, you know a little success story of uh, somebody who who really set themselves up well and and were able to avoid uh, some major losses? Yeah, so we had a you know a doctor. Uh, I, he's like a some sort of surgeon, and when he was doing surgery, he accidentally you know like clipped an artery, um, got sued. He had you know his malpractice, but the lawsuit was over the million dollar limit mark. So he had another two million that had to be you know accounted for for the judgment. And because this was set up, you know, and he had the bridge trust option, um, we ended up being able to settle the um, excess two million for literally pennies on the dollar, just because you know the strength of the asset protection suit, you know, the asset protection system that we created. That's great. Well, you know, our our, our listeners are primarily folks fifty years of age and older. Um, they're either approaching retirement or in retirement and uh they're they're really realizing that uh you know they may not have the the funds that they thought they would have in their latter years and and so they're looking at real estate investing as a means for them to invest um uh, somebody you know maybe just getting into it or maybe early stage um what would be uh, actually a couple of things here one um, what's the value of having an attorney maybe in your own state, uh, even though let's say you're investing out of state where you're also going to need legal support for those properties in that state, right? So that was kind of a two-part question. One, you know, the importance of having a local a real estate attorney. And then second of all, um, the, uh, the, what would be sort of the, the foundation of getting started? What, what do they have to do from a legal standpoint to really just uh, uh, make it a successful you know, uh, venture for them? Yeah, so I would say you know, the benefit of having a local attorney is that whatever, there's certain things that for asset protection we can do nationwide because it's just transactional work. Um, so for me, I can represent clients in any state doing what I do. Um, but you do need, you know, a real estate attorney local wise, if you're doing local deals to draft certain documents or do your closing, or if you were to be sued, you're going to have to have a local attorney, you know, licensed in that state to go represent you in court. Cause when you go into court, that's called <laughs> passing the bar. Cause you got to pass that, you know, gate to then go up and you know talk to the judge. Um, the way to set this stuff up right and, you know, get yourself on the right foot of protecting your assets would be just think of the acronym ECCM effectiveness, cost, control, and maintenance. If you start looking through what you're setting up through those realms, um, you're going to set up something that's going to actually accomplish the goal that you want it to do. You know, you want it to protect your assets and you want to actually work. Got it. Good, good advice. Good advice. Well, your, your firm, you're located in Oregon, right? Yeah, I'm located in Oregon. And then I have some satellite offices um, throughout California and Washington. I'm licensed in Oregon, Washington, um, California, and Michigan. I started my career out in California, you know, for as a trial lawyer for a while, and then moved. 
Ah, oh, great. Well, you live in a beautiful state. I, I love Oregon up there. Yeah, it's great. Awesome. Uh, what, what's sort of exciting you about your business in, in the years ahead here? So I was able to uh, systemize my practice. I spent the last you know year and a half um, transitioning my practice from a solo practice to an actual business in the system. And when you look at cash flow quadrants, you know, rich dad, poor dad, you know, I originally moved from an employee working for a firm to a solo practitioner, um, but I was just drowning. You know, there was only so many hours in the day and only so many clients I can personally handle, um, not including trying to run a firm. So I learned I had to move to the right side of the quadrant and actually just decide, like, I need to run a business and create systems and processes. And so I was able to, I spent this last year and a half just deciding I have to just, you know, act what act and do what senior managing partners do of firms and business owners do and focus on creating the systems and the procedures and run a business. And it actually freed up a lot of my time and made me more efficient. And so that's, you know, what the exciting thing I've did the last, you know, over the last year. Oh, that's great. So you can scale now, right? Yeah. You're in a good position yeah. to scale. I love it. Exactly. Well, we're uh, kind of this thing is zip by here, and uh, it's a shame because a lot of I, I still have a ton of questions here. But mm -hmm. You're going to start to charge me after a while, but uh, this is what we call our wrap it up session, where yeah. I ask you a series of quick questions, and you uh, just give us your quick responses, and you know, you share resources that have a value to you. Yeah. So, first question: favorite real estate book? Um, yeah, The Richest Man in Babylon. Um, I wanted to increase my financial IQ and to learn how to be my own bank and lend money and get collateral and how to hypothecate it on notes and all of that. And that went into like the wealth code and so forth. And I just learned how to, you know, be my own bank and, you know, losers save money. If money's not moving, it's dead money. So I just wanted to learn how to, you know, make my money, make more money. That's great. Love it. How about just favorite uh, general business book? Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the Cashflow Quadrant. You know, like I used it myself in my own business practice. I love it. Yeah, it does. My favorites too. Uh, how about uh, most valuable website for success? Yeah, um, I don't think one just works, but you know, for your real estate investor listeners, Bigger Pockets. I love you know the educational content that they get from there and the calculators, and I also like the Oxford Club for um, stock investments. Ah, excellent. How about favorite app? Yeah, my activity app on my watch, you know, a big component of mind, body, soul, and it's a great way to, you know, self-motivate and compete with yourself. I love it. That's great. Uh, how about uh, favorite quote? Oh, yeah, I'm going to kind of military principle this up here. Improvise, modify, adapt, and overcome. You, know, you have to embrace the life of pivoting. You know, I came out in the worst economic time probably ever, you know, and I just wasn't afraid to fail. I jumped in the deep end and I just kept pivoting. And, you know, I can care less about failure. And I just look at it as the sooner I start failing, the sooner I start learning and improving. Um, I just don't make the same mistakes twice. You know, everybody has fear. I have fear. It's just a matter of what you do with it. You know, some people freeze. I get motivated by it. That's great. That's great. And how about sort of best cost advice for uh, somebody, especially, uh, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs listening and uh, it sounds like you've definitely gone through that part of it. Uh, what would you, your advice? Big learning experience, you know, going through, and I'm going to kind of Robert Kiyosaki and Dave Ramsey, this one is going to sound to some of your listeners probably too direct, but, you know, you need to have a personal and financial makeover and stop living a delusion. Um, you need a strong base camp before you scale a mountain. So just learn what rich millionaires do and copy them and do what they do. You know, break financial stupidity. You know, unfortunately, we're not taught these things in school anymore. Um, nobody's born financially smart. I'm not. I just jumped into it and learned as much as I could on my own. So just don't feel bad if you don't know these things. So just start learning them. Um, increase your financial IQ. Have a budget. But just tell your money what to do for you. That's the point of having them. Um, and they don't teach this, like I said, anymore. But the problem I see with a lot of clients, even a lot of clients and people is they're competing with the Joneses. But what they don't understand is their neighbor, the Joneses, are stupid also because they don't do math very well. And so everybody's just competing with each other, living these, you know, broken ideas and ideologies, collecting a lot of debt. And they're just stuck on a hamster wheel spinning their wheels. 
And so if you want to be rich, study the rich. Like if you want to be in shape, do what in shape, you know, strong muscular people do, not the 300 pound fat guy. You know, just the rich people, I have a lot of benefits of my profession. I get to talk to millionaires and multimillionaires every day. So I get to know what they do and their habits are and they're not what you think they are. Most of them live in a middle class home. They stop wearing, you know, they don't wear expensive 400 pair dollar jeans. Um, they live reasonable. They buy used cars, pay them off in full. They're not living, you know, like the Ken and Barbie fake credit debt life. They're not overly obsessed about how they look. They pay everything off month to month. Um, they can actually rub, you know, millionaires can actually rub two dollars together because they're penny pitchers. And so I would say the reality is that if you're trying to live like Ken and Barbie, you know, you stop living broke and desperate, you know, get off the rat race, stop spinning your wheel. Um, it's just a facade. It's going to take, it's like a drug, break the habit, break the drug. Um, and you're going to be a lot better off. Mimic the rich, you know, don't take advice from the 300 pound guy, take advice from the financially lean and mean person. Mm, great advice. Great advice. Well, I'm sure there's folks listening here. I'd like to know uh, more about uh, you and what you do. And um, uh, what, what's the best way for folks to, to reach you? Yeah, so they can reach me at my email, Brian, B-R-I-A-N at btblegal.com or my website, www btblegal.com and I do free initial consultations and I have lots of free information and downloadable brochures and educational videos for them to watch. Um, I used to charge for the consultations, but I just think that people need to be educated and there's a lot of misconception out there, but they don't call lawyers because they don't want to spend the money without, you know, with, with an indecisive mindset, but you have to be able to be educated to make an educated decision. So, you know, I just, I'm going to do this for free, educate you. Even if you take what I'd say and go find somebody else cheaper to do it, I don't care. Just get the education, know what, you know, your options are and do, do what you're going to do. That's great, Brian. Well, I appreciate that. Well, we have a tradition here on the Old Dogs REI Network. Uh, of course, we're called Old Dogs here, and uh, all of our guests get to close us out with their best old hound dog howl. So, uh, you know, you're up in Oregon. You know, there's like wolves and stuff up there, right? <laughs> yeah, we got, we got. <laughs> So I know you're sick, and I, and I, I appreciate you, you know, coming on with that uh, cold that, that uh, still didn't hamper the great information you gave us. But, uh, you know, we'll keep that in mind when you give us your howl. Thanks, no problem. So here we go. Oh! <laughs> All right. I thought you were closing out with a good cough, you know, at the end of that. But it was, I'll, I'll give you a real, I'll give you a, a good uh, hound dog howl. <laughs> that was a great howl. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Brian, for being on. I really appreciate it, and uh, so do our, our listeners as well. No, oh, thanks for having me on. I also want to thank all our old dog listeners out there for joining us. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing right now, but the fact that you've taken the time to join us means a lot, and we really appreciate it. Please note everything we talked about, everything that Brian presented today will be outlined in our detailed show notes uh, on our website at olddogsreinetwork.com forward slash blog and uh, of course you're gonna you're gonna look for our special episode on asset protection with uh, brian bradley well thanks uh, again uh, that's the show for today remember cash flow is king and real estate investing the means until next time keep moving forward and may god bless thank you very much for visiting the old dogs rei network we would greatly appreciate if you would stop by itunes and let us know what you think of the show we would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.